Hi, everybody. Um, I apologize. I'm going to be speaking a little more quietly than I ordinarily do during talks. Um, so I should mention in the beginning, this is all joint work with Kunal Chala, who is a master's student, Hurang Pagani, and Julio Piozo. I am interested in the certain boundaries. And one side goal I have for this talk is some people think that the Psalm boundaries are abstract, and I want to fight as hard against this notion as I can. I can't understand anything abstract, and I can't understand the Poisson boundary. Therefore, and that's a proof, Poisson boundaries can't be abstract. So I'll give a definition. I'll give um, right, a little bit, right, I know Tiani talked about that, but I'll give a little bit of a reminder of some things that were said, and then I'll try and give you an actual way to think about it, at least in a lot of cases. So, so what is a Poisson boundary? So if you have G, a countable group, and mu, a probability measure, on G, I guess I should say all my groups are countable throughout this talk. I'm not going to at any point ever consider a locally compact group that is not countable or even worse, a Polish group. I mean, look, I love Polish groups, but not when it comes to sound boundaries. Um, so you have a, a countable group G and a probability measure mu. There's a very easy notion of a harmonic function which I want to say is the following, right? It's a function from our group to the reals so that f of x is just the average after you take a random walk for a one-time step. And I'm going to always abuse notation. It's a countable set if I have a measure of mu. Mu of g is just going to be how much measure I assign to my element G. And so harmonic functions are great things to study. They're really rigid. Um, they give you a lot of information about the group. Um, there's a proof of Hermann theorem on polynomial growth by understanding harmonic functions. And uh, let's just say they're are no easy proofs of that. Somebody in the audience has a proof, but there are no easy proofs of this fact that I know of. Um, but, right, and in general, they can tell you just a lot about your object. But if you look at all harmonic functions, well, there's are sort of just too many, right? If you, that's going in sort of thinking analogously to complex analysis, oh, I want to understand all holomorphic functions, great. They have some very nice properties, but that's sort of too broad a thing to even hope for a reasonable classification for. So we start, save ourselves a little bit of problems and add, or a lot of problems, and add one of the nicest regularity things we can do. What about bounded harmonic functions? And the thing is, right, so maybe these are an object we can hope to classify. Now, the issue is that, in general, you expect, even for bounded harmonic functions, there to be a lot of them. In particular, right, like, there's going to be uncountably many of them. Bounded harmonic functions, you can take sums of them, you can multiply them by scalars, you can take, you know, integrals of them. Right, integrate over a bunch of different bounded harmonic functions and get another harmonic function. Like this is some nice class of spaces, but 
hoping to really understand it in general, it's too huge. And it's like saying, I want to classify all the points on some uh, simplex, right? That's, that's great, but really there's a lot of things going on in the middle. And it just suffices to understand what the extremal points look like. And so, where's an eraser? So, the first thing, which I'm not going to give as an actual definition, but I will want to give as an intuition, is that the Poisson boundary classifies the extremal bounded harmonic functions. And Tiani gave a very good presentation of it last week for people who were here, right? You can see what an actual formalization of it is. I don't want to go into the formal details of exactly what I mean here. And in particular, there are plenty of ways you can interpret my statement so that it's false, but there's also some that are true. So a little bit more concrete to somebody trained in descriptive set theory like me is the following. And this is, I think, much closer to how I actually think about it. But I'll try and give actual intuitions later, which is I look at my random walk trajectories, G1, G1, G2, G1, G2, G3, and so on and so forth. And I want the weakest notion of asymptoticity that I can get. I want to say, what does it mean for two trajectories to be asymptotically the same? Well, and you know, let me just draw these as trajectories actually on the natural numbers, right? One trajectory might be this, and the other trajectory might be, um, you'll notice that these trajectories, right? Once you sort of change time a little bit and you throw away the beginning, they're exactly the same. I would say that any two things where when you remove the first finitely many coordinates, possibly a different finitely many coordinates for each one, tail equivalence, we, I'll just write this formally, G1, G1, G2, G1, G2, G3 is tail equivalent. H1, H1, H2, H1, H2, H3. If there are some N and M so that for all K, G1, all K through Gn plus K is going to be equal to H1 through Hm plus K. So these two trajectories are going to be literally the same, except, you know, up to time change and throwing away finitely many coordinates. From N plus 1? What? You want to start from N plus 1, not from the start? Um, I want to say, yeah, oh. from, oh, sorry. Oh, oh, I see. Okay. okay. Yeah, I want to say, I, I want to ignore, for example, G1, G2, and G3 might be very different than H1, H2, H3, H4, and H5, but as long as eventually they're the same, I'm okay. So this is an equivalence relation. And my random walk, where just by definition, it comes with a very natural measure on trajectories, right? I can say, if I tell you, oh, my first 11 steps, I'm going to do this. There's some probability associated with that. If I give you any Borel event, there's some probability associated with that. So I'm going to look at same space as my random walk trajectory. But um, the sigma algebra is only going to be tail invariant sets. 
So if you know I have something, if for example, I have a trajectory which is eventually zero from some point onwards, then I allow myself, then I have to have all trajectories which are eventually zero. If I have the trajectory which goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, et cetera, et cetera, I need to do all trajectories that from some point onwards are just a constant plus n. So this is going to be my actual definition for what the Poisson boundary is. And the miraculous thing is that under this very weak notion of equivalence, this is still an object we can classify and understand. And I should emphasize very heavily the Poisson boundary, right? It's not just a function of the group. It's a function of both the group and the measure, right? You can't just say, right over this one. You can't just say, what is the Poisson boundary of a group? You have to say, what is the Poisson boundary of about, you can only ask about the Poisson boundary of G mu, not of G. It doesn't even make sense to say it for G because the Poisson boundary is something where you have a, a random walk and you have a group. It only makes sense with a measure which generates that random walk. Now, now that I said it, let me ignore what I just said and say what I can say about the sound boundary just about the group, not ignoring the measure. The thing I just said was illegal. For any probability measure, non amenable implies non trivial the sound boundary. We're non trivial here, just means that there's some event whose probability is not zero or one, right? There's some tail measurable event whose probability is not zero or one. And virtually no potent implies some boundary is trivial. So if you're virtually no potent, that means you don't have a Poisson boundary. This object gives you no information. It's very trivial. So from the point of view of bounded harmonic functions, they're literally all constants. There's nothing to see here. So here's, I think, a very natural question. What groups can we identify the Poisson boundary for all measures, for all probability measures. So for what um, groups, right? And it might be a different boundary depending on the measure. It might depend on the property of the measure, but can I just always say what the Poisson boundary is gonna be? Well, I know some examples where I can do it. I just said that for virtually no point groups, the Poisson boundary is always trivial. I can always identify it with a point. I can say, there's nothing to see here, and that is an identification. It's just a very boring one. Um, but for non virtually no point groups, we don't have a single example. And I'm lying here a second. That's only true for finitely generated groups. We have a slightly more complicated criterion where we know exactly where it's trivial um, for ca general countable groups. But really, we don't know of any way, case where we can identify it for all measures, except for the very, very boring case where it's always trivial. And well, okay, fine. In some sense, you've identified it. But it really feels like cheating to say, look, I, I can always identify this object. It's just a point. Okay. And on the other hand, despite the fact that we can't do this, we really can do this um, for many measures. Like the Poisson boundary is a thing 
that there has been measures where it's been identified for. So for example, and this is due I'm in over 2000. Many groups where I'll just say hyperbolic groups, amalgamated free products, et cetera. It's in fact going to be a very, very long list of groups, and I don't want to say all of them. So call group. If I want, if I, you allow me to be informal, I'll say hyperbolic ish groups, groups that seem like hyperbolic groups in some way. You can identify the boundary, assuming we need to do two assumptions here. One, you need mu to have finite entropy. And somehow this is really crucial. We need, um, we really lack tools to understand things without finite entropy assumptions. It's really, really hard to identify some boundaries. And I only know one case where we can do so non-trivially. And the second assumption is that mu has finite logarithmic moment. So what does finite logarithmic moment mean? Um, it means you take the log of the word length and you take the expectation of that and it's finite. So basically the elements don't grow, the measure doesn't grow too quickly. You don't choose very, very long elements with too high probability. And I'm going to have succeeded in doing this for many, many groups. So what do we do? Oh, this is a bad one. Sorry, that's a big question. Yeah. Is this again the case that under these assumptions, these are always the same? Or are there different ones depending on the measure? Because you said you can uh, identify the plus plus and the plus. So is it all yeah, so just give a good an example here. Um, it's a great question. Um, and actually, from here on out, this applies for many, many groups. Maybe they all result will apply for many, many groups. Let me just talk about hyperbolic groups. And because I'm sure there's at least a few people in the audience who don't know what a hyperbolic group is, let me talk about the easiest example of a hyperbolic group, which is a free group on more than one generator. The free group on one generator is not going to work. But F2, F3, F4, choose your favorite finite number greater than one and less than infinity. But for Fn, these boundaries are always just going to be the hidden measure on the end of the trees. So right, if I have something like this, right, there's some very natural boundary events, which are, does your random walk, which um, sort of point on the boundary of the tree does your random walk converge to? And as Siani talked about last week, at least in one of the problem sessions, you will always converge to um, one of these points. More generally, you will do that you will converge to a point in the hyperbolic boundary for any hyperbolic group. So you're going to converge here. And the Borel events made by just taking unions of these things, unions of points on this boundary, is exactly the Poisson boundary. And there are going to be things with positive measure, or zero measure, all sorts of interesting fun stuff. It's just going to be the odds that you infinite trajectory ends up hitting that point on the boundary. So, right, the Dean proves this. If you have finite entropy and you have finite logarithmic moment, you don't need finite logarithmic moment. So this is true for every finite entropy measure. And I should say, it's really unclear to me whether or not it should be true if you get rid of this um, finite entropy thing. Uh, there are many, many examples of Poisson boundaries behaving very differently in the finite entropy regime, in the not finite entropy regime. It's, just, it's not just like we have all sorts of cool phenomena that can occur when you don't have finite entropy. 
but that don't occur when you do a finite entropy. It's somehow actually really a natural barrier. And the boundary is also just going to be this hitting measure on the tree. So this is the first example. Why do I care about this? This is the first example of any group other than these very trivial examples where the boundary is always trivial, where we can identify the boundary for every finite entropy measure. Yeah? This goes through for hyperbolic groups. It goes through, like in a bit, I will, like at the end, I will give a list of seven or eight different wide things which this applies to. You can identify our techniques are powerful enough that basically every group which is hyperbolicish in a stronger sense, even in a weaker sense than Vadim's. We have more examples um, where you could compute the Poisson boundary um, for with this moment assumption. You no longer need it. Right. So we're completely killing the necessity of having any moment conditions. We don't know whether you can drop the finite entropy assumption. We don't know whether you can drop the finite entropy assumption. Our proof relies on it very crucially. It's not a thing. Um, there is no known example where you can't do it. And for the free group, this is like a very hard question. Why is finite entropy such a good thing? Well, right in Vadim's paper, where he sort of introduces how you actually identify this. He gives the following really cool um, idea um, to identify the Poisson boundary. And here's the way I'll phrase it. So let B be a boundary. And the boundary here just means some subset of the Borel sigma algebra, which is also going to be right something which is pale equivalent. It has to be a sub sigma algebra of the Poisson boundary, and it has to be invariant under the group action. So it's going to look a lot like the Poisson boundary, but possibly not be the entire thing. Then B the is the Poisson boundary if the entropy of the random walk conditioned on B. And what I mean by entropy of the random walk, I look at the entropy of mu to the n. I look at the entropy of my nth step convolution conditioned on B. So conditioned on what boundary point I end up at. If this is little o of n, then you've actually identified the boundary. So the only case you, right, so the way, if your boundary is only wrong, is there sort of some finite entropy amount of information that you're missing. And this is really the tool. Every, with one exception, which is based on a paper, um, mine, Omer Tamuzi, the Earhart, and Puyo Vihili Padausis, um, this is the paper of Anna Ursula Karmanovich, um, was that one exception for very, very special measures. Every identification of the Poisson boundary really has to go through this entropy thing at some point. We really don't have any tools to identify Poisson boundaries other than entropy. We know for one class of very, very special measures. Yeah, if, yeah, if the entropy, so you look at the entropy of mu to the n, you look at where you are after n steps, and I'm going to tell you the boundary point, right? And I want to know how much entropy I have. So, but once I've conditioned on the boundary point, right, this is going to modify things a lot. And for people like me who find um, conditioning on sigma algebra a little weird, a little bit hard to think about, you can just choose any event in the sigma algebra and condition on that, right? So you basically, you got to choose whatever event you'd like to in your sigma algebra um, and B. Um, you know, which will be positive measure, condition on that, and then ask, you know, how much entropy is there? And if you can make that sublinear, then you've identified the Poisson boundary as B. If in general, if you can't, if in general, this is super linear, right? There's no event you can find which will make it sublinear, but you can choose a different event for every n, then um, it's not the whole boundary. 
This is the net way of statement. Can you write that? Sure. I think the thing you say was on the right-hand side of that equality sign. Maybe all then. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so let me just write this out in quantifiers. This is much closer to how I actually think about it because I don't like the fact. Right, for every n, if for every n there exists, I don't know, let's even say a finite partition of B, and what do I mean by a partition here? I want a partition into B measurable events. You're not right, so I break up B into finitely many, right, this putative boundary into B measurable events. So is that is the sigma algebra of the of, a, of, a, of something we're trying to test if it's a sum boundary or not, right? Um, such that the entropy of, I'm going to call this mu to the n, but what I mean is the nth step of my random walk. Let's call this partition P, conditioned on P, row sublinearly. So actually I'm asking you to choose at the beginning a sequence of partitions, one for every n, so that when I look at the sequence of conditional things, of conditional entropies, it grows sublinearly. Yeah, good idea. Then B is the boundary. So the, to tell us something the boundary, all I need to do is find a sequence of partitions so that when I look at these partitions, right, I know in an entropy sense almost where I am. The error to how much I know where I am is sublinear. Do we need any condition on the partition, or I guess they it needs to be demeasurable. But they don't they have to get finer somehow, or no? You can choose any partition. I mean, you can, of course, without lots of generality, make some finer. Right? Like condition on more information never hurts. But you can choose the partitions however you want. And I should be very clear. This I should emphasize in bold because it's really important. This only works for finite. Entropy mu. If mu does not find an entropy, nothing like this works. We really, really do not know how to pull this off. Like, so this is a criterion for finite entropy mu deciding whether something's a boundary or not. It's an if only if. Let me try and give you an example of this condition at work. So this is your theorem, like the one you No, no, this is uh, known. This is known, yeah. This is a reformulation, like this is a concretization of um, like Vadim's result from um, his, this 2000 paper. Um, I think it's that one. I think it's not from the 84. But like, I think like this is, taking out all the abstraction and putting in quantifiers instead. Well, not all the abstraction, but removing a lot of it. Instead of conditioning on a sigma algebra, now you're just conditioning on a sequence of partitions. But if you like to condition on sigma algebra, then it's uh, a little bit cleaner, but I always find that a little bit uh, scary to think about. So let me give an example. Um, so first of all, And I should say this result is due um, to Brian Fogani and Julio Chirgo. This is a little bit earlier than our joint paper together. They did the free semi group. And I'm going to explain how I think of the free semi group a little bit different. They proved this same result for finite entropy measures, but just sort of for the free semi group. I'm going to explain how I think of an argument that does it. It's a little bit different. Than, or I think moderately different than how they phrase it in their thing. So, first of all, if I look at the, if I take a random walk on the free semi group, which is just, you know, all strings of the form A, B, A, A, B, 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 like the free group, but with no cancellation, 
I have one very nice feature, which I will not have in the free group, which is I can literally just compute the length of an element and it's a homomorphism. Right? This doesn't hold in the free group, right? The cancellation. But in the semi group, there's no cancellation. It's very nice. And, you know, the, if I look at the entropy of the length, right? So I look at the length of mu to the n. This has sublinear entropy. Two things. First of all, this is a fun exercise to prove by hand if you haven't done it. Right? The point is actually this length homomorphism is a homomorphism to the natural numbers, which is a subgroup of Z. So here's a slick way to prove it. But if you want to do it concretely, it's a fun exercise. You can talk to me after the lecture. A slick way to prove it is Z, as I mentioned earlier, has trivial Poisson boundary. As I just mentioned, trivial Poisson boundary is the same thing as having zero entropy. And so this random walk has to have zero entropy. If I just keep counting the length after a very, very long number of steps, that's going to have zero entropy. All right. So here you started with some you know, measure on A and measure on B. And... It's a measure on B, it's a measure on AB, it's a measure on BB, it's a measure on AAAAABBA, it's a measure on. This word is going to have length two to the two to the two to the n, but just consider things from very very large measure. It's going to not be supported on any finite. Set. It's going to be very like, but it will have finite entropy, right? If I look at this measure, right? If I look at the entropy of the length, so this is going to have sublinear entropy. Now, what is the period of boundary on the free semigroup? Well, there's an obvious thing you're going to converge to. And here it really is obvious, at least that you will converge. Like in the free group case, it requires a little bit of work, but here it's really easy. That eventually you'll converge to some infinite word. Right? If I have a random walk on the free semi group, eventually there's some infinite word I converge to. So I want to know where I am after n random n steps of my random walk. And I've told you um, what the infinite word you're going to converge to is. You know you're going to converge to this infinite word. What do I need to tell you now to tell you your position? Okay. I need to literally just tell you the length where you are. But the length as I just said, has sublinear entropy. Therefore, right, you know, right, if I condition on the length, I know exactly where you are, but that means that the Poisson boundary, right, that means I can tell you a sublinear amount of information and tell you exactly where you are. It means the entropy is sublinear, right, just by this easy fact about conditional entropies, right? Because we're saying H of mu to the N conditioned on boundary, conditioned on length. It's literally zero. There's literally no information here, but that means that H of mu to the N is less than H of length of n, or H of mu to the n conditioned on the, when I say boundary, I should say the infinite word boundary, because that's the one we're trying to show is the Poisson boundary. So conditioned on the infinite word boundary, you're going to have entropy less than H of length. So you're going to have sublinear entropy. And therefore, that means the original boundary was the right boundary. So. This is really nice. Let me check how much longer I have. I have only five more minutes. Plus epsilon. What? Plus epsilon. Plus epsilon. Okay, I'll, I'll, 
I might use some of my epsilon. How much harder do you have to work for the free group? Substantially. Um, this is a this is a core idea, but unfortunately, and this really is painful. Length is no. There's two problems you have to deal with. First of all, length is no longer a homomorphism to z. Right? This is fun fact that length of the homomorphism to z only applies to the semigroup. And second of all, ball, length is no longer quite enough. Why is it no longer quite enough? Because right on the, if I tell you the length of your way to the free semi-group, you know you're exactly on the geodesic to infinity. Whereas on the free group, if I just tell you your length n, a priori, you could have uh, deviated from the thing. There's no reason you're on that. So the key tool we use here is there's a notion, I think, I apologize, I'm probably gonna get the dots wrong, um, of Guzel, and I guess, yes, I should say, I think this is 2023. Um, it's, it's been out for a bit, but I think it was just published, of pivots. And let me say what a pivot is. Let me just say it for a free group. And let me tell you, a tiny lies. This is only going to be a positive percentage of pivots. It's not going to be all of them. Um, so a pivot. When I take some random walk on the free group, it does some things. At some point is a pivot. If, right, so I look at some IMTN. If, basically, I look at my ge right, geodesic to infinity. I cut here. Everything from this time onwards is, you know, closer to my geodesic to infinity from everything before that time. So at that time, you start going towards infinity. Right? At that time, you're on route to infinity beforehand, right? You're farther away from infinity than where you want it to be, and then you come after. So it's a nice notion of a point. Does it mean you're not going to deviate from that point? No, you can still deviate, but your deviations will be, but like it's, and, and I, in fact, I will deviate, but my deviation will be something like this. I won't be able to deviate. Um, like behind it. Like exactly, I won't be able to deviate, um, but I won't ever go secretly back here mm -hmm. and deviate here. I just draw the trajectory and I'm literally thinking about this as drawing A, B, I'm literally thinking about going A and then B on my graph. I'm not just, you know, jumping, but I'm, you know, sliding a little bit trying to get where I'm trying to go. Is that subtree that point on track? Yes, you're going to be in that subtree from that point on. Um, exactly. And not, you're guaranteed to have such points a positive density of times. And this is due to Gazelle. So we look at pivot times. And so at pivot times, the nice thing is I tell you you're at a pivot time. And again, I, I should say I'm fudging the definition a tiny, tiny bit to let an epsilon error um, you know, disappear, but this doesn't change anything. Once you're at this pivot time, right, these are positive density of things. And here it does suffice to know the length. So we've solved one of the problems. The other problem, but now the problem is that you're not a homomorphism. But we can control cancellation. So what we need is, in, in essence, estimates of exactly how much cancellation you get, how much large cancellations you get. And this is, um, you know, some work. There's some actual work breaking up your random walk saying, okay, this goes here, this goes here, this goes here. And all these things have low entropy. So the whole thing has low entropy. But even though it's substantially harder than in the free group, the free semi-group case, it is doable. 
And let me just say, I want to give a sense of how broadly it applies because I, I've talked about the free group case, but our methods extend much further. And I won't give the actual technical condition, which gives the if and only if, but I will give a bunch of examples because you know maybe some of you like um, different groups. So you have one, you have three groups, and then the boundary is uh, you know ends of tree. Second of all, you have hyperbolic groups. And then your boundary is hyperbolic boundary. And all of these are proofs of all fine entropy, uh, non-degenerate measures. And we don't know how to do them without this. Three, you can have, um, I guess I should say, F infinity. That's also a little bit of a different case than Fn. Um, you can have the out Fn and the free factor complex. You can have relatively hyperbolic groups and the cone off space. You can have mapping class groups and the curve complex. And this is not an exhaustive list. We give more like interesting examples in the paper, but this method applies really broadly. It applies to all sorts of things that were previously known with some moment conditions. And we can just say, you actually don't need the moment conditions. All you need to do is be able to pin down the position and then say that what the length is. You mean using these pivots? Yes. Yeah. yeah, we call this the pin down approximation because really the one, what you need to do is pin down the length, pin down exactly where you are at given positions. Uh, estimating the length or something similar to length. So you sort of estimate the number of pivots along the way or something? Yeah, now already. And these just exist a positive density of the time. They don't have large gaps between them, but it's exponentially unlikely you do. Pivots are really nice and really ubiquitous. Um, the proof of this is not so, so hard, but I'm not going to, I definitely don't have time to do it right now. The sound boundary that you can't have, though, is that not true? Sound boundary is a prior, is just a measure space with hanging thing. But also, these models are mostly compact. Which one is not compact? I'm, uh, it's like F infinity, and then it means like the boundary. The boundary of F infinity is not compact. Yeah, but yeah, it's not. You're right. But um, it's still the right model. I mean, maybe there's a different model. Which is compact, but I think it's natural to do that. Also, it's not uh, how do I say? It? It's not so hard to make it compact if you would like to do that. There are right different um, metrics you can put on it that will make it compact. For this nice little kind of diving into this abstract area. Yeah. For questions, yeah. not so relevant for your uh, theorem, but you are the the ones for semi groups. Are they uh, mixing, like the measure is, is it mixing? Say yes, that's a weak mixing. So me, meaning like if I if I uh, take a product uh, diagonal action with the PMP ergodics, then I get uh, uh, an ergodic action. The honest answer is I would need to think that I always get confused about these things for non PMP so action. Yes, yeah, so this proof came in in the second value setting by the minority and then yeah. the more generality by uh, Bader for me. Yeah. So, yes, but it's not trivial. I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, I understand it's trivial. Okay, yeah, cool. Yeah. But that's good. Thank you. So, weak mixing in this league, not measured with your reason. Yes, okay. yes, yeah, 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 yeah. just the product with the PMP and body. Yeah. So, but there are no more questions. Is the condition that G has a compaction element? Yeah, the in condition is that you have, um, let me find it for one second. Um, I want to make sure I'm not lying. You have at least one WPD element and you act on a geodesic hyperbolic space. Yeah.